right? So just to define this. Uh, but we're going to define it for the lung, OK? Um, actually, I think the compliance question is all turned out pretty well. Um, OK, let me see. OK, so let's, uh, let's define this. And we're also going to talk about uh, sort of the, um, the counterpart of compliance, which is elastic. Everything okay? Did I forget to do something? Is there something on my back? Okay. So I was talking suddenly, I thought something was wrong. Okay. How about the slides up? Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's easy. All right. So if we change our transpulmonary pressure, okay? And, and maybe we should unpack that. What is our transpulmonary pressure? The pressure difference between which two locations? The lung, the alveoli, right? And then on the other hand, the intrapleural space. Okay, so that's the transpulmonary pressure. We can consider this a delta P, a difference in pressure across the lung wall. Okay. So if we have a change in our transpleural pressure, as if we, let's say we inhale, right? And we inhale and that makes that transpleural pressure greater. And we want to know how much how much volume change do we get in response to that pressure change? That's a question of compliance, right? So when we're asking about issues of compliance, we're, we're basically asking the question about the, the properties of the lung's expandability. In other words, how much does it, uh, how much volume change occurs for that given amount of uh, pressure change, okay? And elastins is, a, it's, a, it's a slight variation on this, on this question, okay? but instead, we're asking how much transpleural pressure do we have to have to get a certain change in volume, okay? So let me put this in, in, sort of a, in terms of an analogy, right? So if we are, if we have a rubber band or a balloon or something expandable, right? And we want to stretch that thing out, right? We can apply a force, right? We're asking about compliance. If we apply a force, and we're asking how much does it stretch, okay? A skinny little rubber band is going to stretch a lot. It has a lot of compliance, right? And for the exact same force, we might have a big fat rubber band that doesn't stretch much at all, okay? So if we want to know how stretchable or expandable something is with a given pressure that's and then elastins is, um, mathematically, it's the inverse, if you happen to care about that. Um, but mathematically, we're talking about um, something that is always going to be opposite to compliance. Okay? So if that rubber band is stretchable, highly stretchable, highly compliant, it's going to have low elastins. And elastins is, again, resistance to stretch. Okay? So if we want to if we want to measure that rubber band's ability to, to, to snap back or to resist our stretching, that's elastins. Okay. So let's take a look at the lung in light of this. Okay. So here is a lung. We're going to change the lung volume. All right. So lung volume goes up along the vertical axis, right? and we're going to apply a transpulmonary pressure across the bottom. So at the very, very bottom, how would you describe our compliance here relative to the rest of it? At the very bottom, we've got, let's say, in, in this area right here. Based on what you've learned before, is this high compliance or low compliance? Experience, right? It's really hard to blow up at first, right? It, it takes a lot of pressure to, to expand the balloon. Right? That's kind of what our lungs are like. And then in the middle, it gets easier. 
right? Is it compliant? So the stretchability goes up. That slope is going up, right? And then as the balloon gets really, really big, before, before it pops, right? It gets harder and harder to put air into. Right? We've all had that experience. The lungs are very much the same. So the compliance goes from low to higher to low again. Okay. So let's let's take um, First, the top one. Let's do the top one. So, for a lung compliance here, it's, it's very low. Right? Imagine your lungs are inflated as high as they can go. It's very, very difficult to add more volume. Right? How would you describe the elastics? You know, it's going to be high. What does this mean? If the elastics is high, what does that mean for the lungs? In, in, in normal human terms, not in terms. The last one is going to be high. Yeah. Does that mean that the lungs are going to they have a, a, a strong ability to snap back or a weak ability to snap back? They're going to be strong. They're, going to, they're very strongly wanting to oppose that stretch. Okay. So as the stretchability goes down, right, it's harder and harder to stretch. That's that's, we, can, we can also describe that as, as the force opposing that stretch, elastance, is getting high. Okay. So in mid-range, we've got high compliance. Right? That is, it's very stretchable. Think skinny rubber band. Okay. But that skinny rubber band doesn't snap back quite as strongly, right? So the, the elastance is going to be low. Okay. So these are always inversely related to each other. So if we can stretch it easily, by definition, we don't have a strong snapback. Okay. Up one up or another words, a strong opposition to stretch. Okay. So there are cases, why are we talking about this? There are cases where compliance is not always the same. Okay, so compliance is the physical properties of the lungs. Right, physical, like a balloon has properties, right? Hard to blow up, and then it's easier to blow up, and then it's hard to blow up further. Okay, lungs are kind of the same way. Other materials might have different properties, but for our lungs, they have these physical properties. And where does it come from? Well, it comes from the, the, the tissues of the lungs. There are elastic uh, fibers, and there are rigid fibers like collagen, and um, all kinds of, of, of biomechanical properties okay, that work together. So emphysema. Um, anybody know the most common cause of emphysema? Okay. Smoking. All right, so you've heard of this. So emphysema is basically a breakdown of lung tissue. And if you look in the alveoli, so on the left is normal. You've got those little alveoli, little sacs. You can see those tiny little walls between adjacent alveoli. What happens in emphysema, and this is, this is a result of chronic irritation. Right, we get this immune response, we get tissue breaking down um, as a result of this, and the walls, the partitions between the alveoli break down. Okay. So we have overall we have less structure to our lungs. Right? So how does that affect the compliance? Right. What would you say about that compliance curve? Generally, are we do we have more or less compliance? More. Okay. So at a resting transpleural pressure, remember this is about <laughs> minus four. What would be different about these lungs in emphysema? At a resting transpleural pressure of about minus four. Right? I'm sorry, transpleural pressure of four. Pick a point on the curve, right? How are the lungs different? Yeah. 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 The, the volume will be higher. Okay. So at at the normal transpleural pressure of four, right? We've got a negative four interpleural space pressure. Those lungs are going to expand further, right? They're more stretchable, and so the lungs end up bigger at rest. That's right. 
How does this work? <clears throat> well, here's another way to view it. Remember this picture? Um, if we've got a, a alveolar pressure of zero, transpolar pressure of four, right? I'm sorry, interpolar pressure of minus four. We've got a force that, that, that I start with right at the top. This is the transpolar pressure. And remember, the transpolar pressure is pulling outward on the lungs. We can have rest, right? We're going to start holding the lungs open. What's responsible for opposing that? Well, this little springy thing, right? What does that represent? What property of the lung? It's elastics, right? It's, it's drive to um, oppose that stretching pressure. Okay? So the elastic properties, or lack of compliance, the elastic properties here are pulling inward on a normal one, and they're opposing the, the transpolar pressure of four. Okay? And they, they meet each other at rest, right? so that the moment between inspiration and expiration, right? we, have, um, we have a moment volume that's stable. Right? Remember the analogy of the balloon in the jar? Right? At some point, it, it can be stable. Right? You can have negative pressure in, inside the jar, but atmospheric pressure inside the balloon and outside. Okay, so it is the lungs elastins that is opposing the transpolar pressure. Okay, now with emphysema, what do we have? What's the problem? Higher volumes. Less elastins. Okay, so our elastins is weaker, right? So we have less of a, an ability to oppose stretching and so the lungs get bigger, okay? And the lungs get bigger, and the resting lung volume is now bigger than normal, okay? So for most, uh, for an average person, two and a half liters is the resting lung volume. That is, after you, you inhale, you exhale, right? And after you've exhaled, how much air is left in your lungs? There's actually quite a bit, right? It's not, your lungs aren't empty. There's two and a half liters combined in your lungs, okay? But in somebody with emphysema, their lungs lack the physical uh, properties to have a, that elastins, right? So they, they get bigger, okay? So they might have a rust, rusting lung value of uh, three liters or three and a half liters, okay? And somebody who has emphysema and has it noticeably, will have a large chest. Okay, so this is called barrel chest. Anybody ever see an older gentleman like this? Usually with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it doesn't only have to be cigarettes, but there are other causes. But cigarette smoke is the most common. And, um, and so the, the chest gets very large. And particularly, you can tell in this anterior posterior dimension. It's one thing that, to have wide shoulders, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the anterior posterior dimension. Uh, the, the pink arrow here, in particular, is, is what gets wider. Okay, so it's like you inhale an extra liter of air, right? and, but that's your resting lung. So you have to inflate your lungs even more to, to move air in. Okay. okay, so if we can have a disease where we we have diminished elastins. I suppose there's a, uh, a counterexample where we have the opposite problem. Of course, yeah. Um, and in generic terms, we would call this fibrosis. Okay, so fibrosis is an increase in collagen fibers. Not the stretchy kind, not the elastic fibers, but the, the kind that aren't stretchable. Okay. So, this is often the result of scarring, which um, is more often than not due to a lung infection. Okay, so tuberculosis and other things can cause buildup of scar tissue. And in these individuals, we have less compliance, less stretchability, okay, but more what? Elastins. Okay. So more ability to resist stretching. But you can imagine that's a problem too, right? You want your lungs to expand when you ask them to. And if they don't, that's a problem. Okay, so we can have both problems. 
And, and so the normal compliance of the lung is a very important thing for establishing the functional residual capacity, the, the resting volume of the lungs. And, of course, we inhale and exhale, and we, we want the lungs to behave accordingly. Okay. So, <clears throat> we've got a question here. So, you've probably heard of surfactant, right? You, you can read. Um, infants born prematurely may not produce enough surfactant, an agent that reduces surface tension. Okay, so inside of your lungs, in your alveoli, you've got a thin film of water coating all of your alveoli. And the net result of that surface tension is to have a force that pulls in <coughs> around your lungs. Okay, and so what does surfactant do? It breaks that surface tension. Right. Everybody clear about what's going on? We have surface tension pulling our lungs inward and, sur and surfactant, which, which we all have here, helps break that surface tension, breaking that inward force. Okay. So given that explanation, which of these curves would, would reflect the situation where an infant doesn't have surfactant? Anybody need more time? Okay. Explaining dancing. All right, lots of you like to see. Who could tell me why? Why do we have decreased compliance if there's no survival? prematurely, I think it's about the 23rd week or so of development that that surfactant begins to be secreted inside the lungs. And, um, and so if you're born around that time or prior to that time, um, those infants are going to have to be on a respirator, okay, because they can't expand their lungs on their own, because it, it takes too much muscular effort to open the lungs. Right. Yeah. Can you have too much surfactant? Uh, could you have too much surfactant? I not in a pathological sense. I'm unaware of any problem with having too much. Okay. Um, you all changed. Good. Okay. We'll let that. All right. So here's a look inside your lungs. All right. And nobody gave up. That's good. Um, or at least admitted to it. Uh, that's the first step. Don't admit it. All right. First, uh, looking inside here, these are a, a couple of alveoli. Okay. And you can notice the walls between them are extremely thin. And there's some capillaries running through those very thin walls, which is really important for how we exchange gases. Okay. Where is their surfactant exactly? The surfactant is found in a thin film of mostly water that's present here. Okay. So we learned about how the, the, um, the respiratory epithelium that's found up higher in the conduction airways has uh, the ability to secrete mucus, right, and propel mucus out. This is different. We're secreting surfactant. Okay, and surfactant mixes in with the water that's present here. The water here, this is, it's 100% humidity in your lungs. All right, so we've got a thin film of water that collects. You can think of it as condensation, I suppose. But the surfactant that's here is made of lots of different molecules, but um, 
There's one in particular, no, you don't need to know the name of it, uh, but for anybody who's interested, there is a top. Um, this is a, but what's important about this molecule is that it is amphipathic, okay? Remember that term? What does it mean for a molecule to be amphipathic? Yeah, it's a charged side or polar side, and then it also has a, a, hydro, um, a hydrophobic side, right? So you've got these little fatty acid tails up here that are sticking up into the air, right? And we have a component at the bottom that's happy to be dissolved in, in aqueous solution. And the way that these molecules align themselves um, is, is just according to those hydrophobic and hydro, hydrophilic parts of, of, the, of the molecules. But, but their presence is, in, is importantly like uh, a detergent. And it helps to break apart surface molecules. Okay? And the, or this, the, the surface tension between water molecules. Right? So water, uh, you know, if you go onto a pond, you can see little bugs crawling on top of the water. Right? They've got their surface tension. This water molecules attract one another. But this breaks it up. Okay? So collectively, all of that surface tension that we see here would tend to work in the direction of collapsing the alveolus. Right? So they would pull inward in all directions, okay? That would be the effect of surface tension. And surfactant reduces that force. Surfactant reduces the inward force. Okay. All right, so that's surfactant. And it's made by a cell that's called a type 2 alveolar cell, or type 2 pneumocyte. You see that listed up here? So most of the cells in the alveolus are type 1. Those are the thin squamous epithelial cells. But there are type 2 pneumocytes. These are the surfactant secreting cells. Okay, so we've got special cells for the production of surfactant. OK. So we need to talk about resistance. How does that make you feel? Um, resistance is um, one of these things. We've got a, a mathematical representation of it. Um, but like other formulas, inertia equation, etc., um, you're not going to have to solve for this. Okay. But again, I want you to know the variables. Okay. So R is resistant. It's on the left, right? Resistance is defined as anything that opposes flow. In this case, we're talking about flow of air, not blood. Okay. All right. So what are the other parts? Viscosity, length, and radius. Okay. So, given where these variables are in the equation, what can we conclude about these three variables? Um, I guess we could start with proportionality, right? Do they move in a proportional way with resistance or in or inversely in proportional? Let's take viscosity. The more viscosity, the, the what? The more resistance. Okay. So these are um, proportional to one another. So resistance is proportional to viscosity. What about length of airways? The way you know that is where they are in the equation, right? They're in the numerator. So um, as you increase one, the other one's going to increase as well. Okay. What about radius? Inversely proportional. Okay. So as the radius increases, resistance decreases. Right? This is the same as with blood pressure, right? All right, what else can we take away? What do you notice about radius at the bottom there? It has a little friend up in the air. What is that? What does it tell you? When radius increases, what's going to happen to resistance? It's going to decrease. But is it going to decrease a little bit or a lot? A lot. A lot. Okay, 
so the radius, um, we, we, so another way of saying this is the, the, the resistance is going to change the fourth power of the radius, right? So we're really going to have more than these other variables. Changes in the radius will have much bigger changes in resistance than, uh, than changes of the, the viscosity of light. Okay. All right, so know, know the proportional changes, right? An inverse, inverse proportional change. Okay. Um, let's run through some examples. Um, this is basically the same thing as with blood, right? Um, so viscosity, does viscosity ever change in the air we're breathing? Not often, right? If you've seen movies, uh, people can breathe uh, liquid, right? But this is not really something that happens with us. What about length? We change the length of our airways? Not really, um, unless we cut part of our lungs out. Okay, which happens, right? People have um, a, a tumor, right? Let's take out the lung, okay? And you can survive, and you have less resistance overall. Okay, what's another way you could shorten the airway besides removing part of the airway surgically? If you have, uh, well, if the tissue dies, yeah, okay, so so one of these, like the, uh, you know, let's say we've got a diminished amount of tissue there uh, through another non-surgical process. Yeah, yeah that, that could be a reason for it. Um, and obstructions as well, right? So if you have an obstruction, um, we don't have a normal lung here. Very often, children will, will inhale things that they shouldn't, Legos, et cetera. Um, and mostly they go down the right side, okay, because the, the right main bronchus there is a little bit more vertically oriented, and so things tend to go down that way than left. But if you were to have complete blockage or obstruction, okay, the effective length of, of airways would be diminished, right, because you're not actually moving the airway anymore, okay? So, so these things can have an impact. One thing I do want to tell you about um, with, uh, with the radius right, is that as a normal part of, part of breathing, as our lungs inhale and exhale, we actually change the radius of our airways. Okay? So if all of your lung tissue is expanded, right, you have big inhalation, all of those alveoli, which are sort of tethered to one another and to the, to the larger airways, they actually have the effect of pulling the airways open. Okay, so in blue here, this might be a, a bronchial or something like that that's serving some alveoli. Okay. And as, as the lung is expanding, all of those tissues are pulled wider open. Okay. So this little curve here shows you as lung volume increases, the airways actually increase as well. Okay. So the more you inhale, the less resistance you encounter. So all of these values um, contribute to resistance, and obviously we don't think of having much resistance when we breathe, no problem, right, for, for a lot of people. Okay. Uh, but these are the factors that kind of go into movement of air, right? So we're, we're creating a difference in pressure, and we're enlarging our um, lungs as a result, right? That air that's coming in is going to encounter resistance from viscosity, right, from the total length of the airways providing friction, and then also um, some resistance to the radius of, of all of these airways. Okay. okay, so we can summarize that that say the, the sources of resistance are coming from the air itself, and this does not really change okay. the length, right? And we can alter that with surgical intervention or obstructions, but most of the time, really not a big deal, right? What about radius? How do we change that? By increasing lung volume, right? So as lung volume increases, what happens to the radius? It also increases, right? The resistance goes down, okay? 
So there's one other way that we can affect radius. What is it? Yeah. Yeah, bronchodilation and bronchoconstriction. Okay, so we can affect the state of, of relaxation or contraction of airway smooth muscle. Okay, and so what we're talking about is the from your trachea to your bronchi to your um, secondary tertiary bronchi, right, bronchioles, all those things. There's smooth muscle as a part of all of those airways. Okay. Generally, we'll call this bronchoconstriction and bronchodilation. Okay. You can get more specific and say bronchiolar constriction if we're talking about bronchioles, but they all kind of work together. So we'll just try to use the term bronchoconstriction and bronchodilation. Okay. So this is smooth muscle, and we can control it. Right. So all of these things here, that are listed up here, with the exception of the contraction and relaxation. All of these things have in common that it's something we don't physiologically regulate. Okay? We don't control that. We don't control the viscosity of the air, we don't control the length of our airways, and we don't control um, resistance by altering our lung body. Okay? It's something that happens, but we can't manipulate it. Okay? We can manipulate the state of contraction of our small muscle. Okay. So, let's talk about that. So, one thing I want to I want to preface this by is saying that um, we are really regulating radius, and radius affects a few things besides res resistance. Okay, it affects resistance, yes, but it also affects other things. Okay, so why would we want to alter our smooth muscle around our airways? Okay, so yes, we would want to minimize resistance. This makes sense, right? There's no reason to have um, extremely small airways if it causes us a lot of energy in order to make, to make breathing possible. Okay. <coughs> We want to minimize anatomical bed space. Okay. What, is, what is anatomical bed space? Back to the reading. Okay, so this is air in your in your in your lungs, your respiratory system that you don't the air that you don't breathe out on expiration. What about on inhalation? Okay, so um, inhalation would be the air that's left over. Um, a, a, a good definition is it's the air that's not, how do you put it? It's um, the air that, it is the air that is not involved in gas exchange. Okay. Remember we made a distinction between the conduction system and the respiratory, and the, um, or the, the conduction airways and the, uh, what was the other thing we called? Your alveoli. Not conduction, but respiratory zone or respiratory area. Okay. So all of the airways from your nose on down to your um, your bronchi uh, bronchioles, not not including the respiratory ones, but, but all of those airways, you're just passing air in and out. Okay, either on inspiration or expiration. That air is not participating in gas exchange. Right. So it's air that you bring in. And you have to exert energy to move in and out of your body. But it's not really participating. Okay? It's not in that respiratory zone of your alveoli where gas exchange happens. Okay? But we have to do it, right? We have, we have to move air in order to get air to our lungs. Okay? So why would we want to minimize this? Does it make sense that you want to keep this to a minimum? What happens if you have a huge anatomical dense space? Enormous bronchi. The downside. That's less air for gas exchange, right? Um, we are energy conscious organisms. Okay? So we don't want to you know, move a liter of air if we're only going to be able to use 100 milliliters of that air for gas exchange. Okay? We want to minimize the amount that we're not using. 
minimize the anatomical dead space. Okay. The anatomical dead space is the air that's found within the conduction zone, right, from nose on down to bronchi uh, bronchioles. That, that, that is, it's not participating in gas exchange. Okay. The respiratory zone is the, what's in the alveoli and is participating in gas exchange. Okay. So we can regulate our, bronch our bronchi bronchioles in order to keep their volume, the, the total volume kind of on the small side. Okay. Um, we also want to reduce our exposure to chemical irritants, right? If we walk into a room that's, that's uh, there's, you know, somebody's been painting something, there's noxious fumes, right? We, we might want to minimize that surface area, okay? So let's run through these real quickly. How would we minimize resistance to bronchoconstrict or bronchodilate? Yeah, bronchodilation would minimize resistance. Okay. What about minimizing the anatomical dead space? Bronchoconstriction. You see, we have a problem, right? Can't have both. Um, what about exposure to chemical irritants? How would we reduce exposure to our, to our surface area? Constriction. Okay. So there's a few things here at odds. Um, and what we do in general terms is there's, there's conditions under which we want to do one or, or, or the other of these things. Okay. So um, we want to minimize dead space when we're at rest. Okay. And we'll see that this is, uh, this is something that parasympathetic nervous system does. It helps us to reduce um, that anatomical dead space when we're just breathing normally. Parasympathetic, you can think of as rest and digest, right? This is the this is the most of the time kind of nervous system. What does that mean for resistance, though? It's a little bit on the high side. Yeah. Okay. So when we really want to minimize resistance is when we're moving lots and lots of volume in and out. When might that be? Exercise, fight or flight. Okay. So the sympathetic nervous system is going to help us to minimize resistance when we're moving lots of air quickly. Okay. And then we have um, a, a general concern all the time for reducing exposure to chemical irritants, right? So if we, um, if we're in an environment where there's no problems, there's no reason to do anything, okay? But if we end up in an environment where there's lots of irritants, we have constriction. So we've got sort of three different scenarios, right? And it's a little bit simplistic to, to categorize everything exactly in those scenarios, but we have basically rest and digest, parasympathetic. We've got fight or flight or exercise using the sympathetic to, to dilate. And then we have a response to irritation that uh, is sort of the third category. Okay, so let's, let's talk about how this happens. Bronchoconstriction can be stimulated by acetylcholine from the parasympathetic nervous system. It doesn't even sound like popcorn anymore. Let's try this again. People have been smelling like popcorn. Let's try that, see how it goes. Okay, so the parasympathetic nervous system 